dungeon crawlers. We would be honored if you would join us. All right, everyone, welcome to another episode of Dungeon Crawlers, where we have survived. We have made it beyond the convention, where many of you have maybe joined us for the very first time. Or, if, like many of you, you have been listening to us for over a decade or more. Thank you. Uh, we have a great show tonight. Uh, thank you for joining us. Thank you for, whether it's the first time or you've been listening forever, you know, just, just think about it. Maybe you one day could be on the show. Cause I mean, literally the other two guys here sitting with me showed up on the show once and uh, they have now are a part of the show. So maybe mm-hmm. one day you can be part of it. Um, but the cool oh. thing is, go ahead. I'll have you know, I showed up twice. I remember distinctly because I botched the first time. <laughs> <laughs> that is true. Um, but I, we have a great topic we want to talk about. It, and maybe you guys might find it a little uh, off-putting. Maybe you may disagree with this. Uh, maybe my fellow compatriots may disagree with us. But uh, we are going to journey to a galaxy far, far away to talk about this this, this particular subject. Uh, if you don't already know what that is, well, then where have you been living? Really? No, just kidding. Uh, I had this really interesting idea and thought that came to my mind. You know, Star Wars, the main conflict about Star Wars is the Jedi and the Sith. My question I want to pose to us tonight is part of our conversation is, would the galaxy itself, you know, that galaxy of far, far away, be a better place without the Jedi? You know, it's a really interesting question. It's one that you have to wonder because, you know, uh, and, and the reason this came to me, this thought, uh, I was recently watching season seven, and there's a moment where Ahsoka is on Coruscant and she's talking to the two sisters, and they, their names escape me. But they're like, you know, the, our lives are the way they are because of the Jedi, because of the war and stuff like that. So <laughs> it made me think of, would the galaxy be a much better, happier place without the Jedi? I'm not even sure where to be. Okay, so hang on a second. Let's clarify this just a little bit. Let's put up some boundaries. Sure. If you say without the Jedi, do you mean without powerful force sorcerers in general, or do you mean without the Jedi Council? Well, I, I, I'd have to say in general, because you know we had the Jedi originally, and there was a fraction in the Jedi, which then had a group of Jedi leave. They landed on Korriban, and they then became the Sith. Um, you know, without that, you know, plus, you know, years later, there was the dogma of the bolts and blah, 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 blah. Where do we want to, you know, or we can go at it from, well, okay, let's the, the Jedi council and this horrible dogma that they broke down and made, I, I I'm okay going whichever way you gentlemen want to go. Well, so maybe here's what I propose then let's start by just the concept of the Jedi Council itself, right? We're not saying that there aren't light side users and dark side users yet, though that'll be the second half of the conversation. The first half is specifically the organization that is the Jedi as we observe them in the Clone Wars to the New Republic. Yes? Yeah, Yeah, I like that. Let's start there. Let's speak to that instead of the old Republic stuff. Yeah, yeah, no, that's great. And maybe, maybe, you know, overlap by 50 or 100 years in either direction. That's totally fine. But, you know, the conceptual thing of where the vast majority of people have watched the films, they understand what the Jedi are in quotes at that time. Well, and it also kind of leans into, you know, the, the quote by Luke, you know, the Jedi are the must be destroyed, Uh, you know. Mm Mm-hmm. Let's, no, it's let's, time for the Jedi to end, is what he said. Yeah, it's time for the Jedi to end, excuse me. Um, it's been a while since I've watched, but yes. So let's jump into that. Yeah. So first and foremost, I'm glad that you brought up that specific quote because I need to stand on another soapbox for you know 30 to 45 oh, no. seconds. Soapboxes. It's true. They're coming out. And this one has Ryan Johnson's name all over it. <laughs> this is a soapbox that y'all have heard me say many times before, which is that episode eight conceptually had some things that I really think should have been explored. And the execution was, 
extremely poor, whether that is specifically Ryan Johnson's doing or Kathleen Kennedy or Disney overarching or whatever. I don't actually care because at the end of the day, the stuff that came out of it that's right. could have been better. And that's, you know, anybody who, anybody who had the reasonable veto power on something and either exercise, exercised it unrighteously or decided not to use it, you contributed to the problem and we're here. Truth. That being said, I do believe that that specifically is one of the vital themes that 100% deserves to be in episode eight and should have been carried over and explored in much greater detail in episode nine and, and made and allowed that to be the primary thesis of the sequel trilogy. In my opinion, that is not to say necessarily that everything that exists in the expanded universe around the gray Jedi and things like that, not, not every detail that was there was perfect or even works in the transplanted Disney universe, but the conceptual idea that, the Jedi were decaying from the inside that they had become victims to their own habits, to their own laws and order and boys club, you know, that to me is like, yeah, okay. We are no longer caring about the force. We're caring about being the wielders of the force. And that's a very different thing in my mind. Mr. Krebs. <sighs> you know, you know, part of my part of my answer here is definitely informed by the way the prequels played out, and I have made it no secret that I am not a fan of the prequels. I actually do enjoy the new sequel trilogy, although I do find that it has flaws and faults as well. But the prequel trilogy was an insult to the to the universe, uh, to the Star Wars universe and its fans, as I see it. And going to the question of like. Would the universe have been better off without the Jedi Council? You know, we've touched on this topic multiple ways over the last couple of years, and we've noted certain things. One is that they they have a prophecy, but they don't talk about from whence it actually comes. Um, they they don't even talk about if they understand the prophecy correctly. Uh, but this whole idea of like someone bringing balance to the Force. And then what is their mission? But their mission is to destroy the Sith. And they see the Sith as a threat to the peace and as a threat to life. So they're going to wage war and kill to sustain peace and life. Which, interestingly, is a concept I totally understand. I get that. But they also have this notion that somehow removing the Sith would make the universe better despite this prophecy of one who brings balance. And they never actually stop to consider what does balance actually mean? So I would say at the very least, the council is misguided. They they are good intended, uh, intended, that's fine, but they are misguided in what they believe balance to be. They think balance to be that the universe is a good place for them and for what they deem to be good versus evil, but they're not considering that there must be opposition in all things. And as you start to remove agents of the force, let's be clear here, Sith and Jedi alike are agents of the force. And the force is so called because it is the power of the universe to regulate itself. And so the force wielders are agents of the force. And when you start wiping out agents of the force, then the force will create new agents. The, the force will find a way, right? So uh, it, we even see that in the, in the attitude of characters who are what we would call force sensitive but they're not force users right so we outside of the jedi outside of the sith you still have people whose lives and destinies and whose influence are all interwoven by the with through and by the force so even if you got rid of the jedi council and it's odd direction it's 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 misguidance um the force would still continue to find a way so would the universe be a better place i dare say yes without the jedi council i think we would have a better path for the fourth sensitive and the uh, force imbued if you will the force wielders to find a more balanced honest path yeah i do have some additional thoughts on some of the things that you said but i want to hear what Dan has to say before I try to open any traps there. Well, so, so th I have a couple points um, that I want to talk about uh, on this. And this will probably spring up some other things. Um, I, 
I'm going to try not to hit every one of them because we just don't have enough time. But <laughs> first and foremost, the council puts some rulings out there. First off, you know, as soon as it becomes known that a child ha has any potential in the force, they immediately take the child. You know, th those childs are taken from their families. We even in episode one, we even hear that, you know, from Qui-Gon saying that, you know, had had Attican been born in the Republic, he, he would have been discovered and taken long ago. Um, the other thing, because I'm, I'm trying to just kind of scan through these. In my opinion, they, uh, the Jedi Council actually fosters corruption and crush all those who oppose them. You know, uh, we see that very clearly when, you know, they, the, the council threw Ahsoka to the wolves pretty much over a crime she didn't commit. Um, which, oh man, if you haven't seen those episodes, that's just heartbreaking, mm -hmm. you know, especially, mm -hmm. but way to go for Ahsoka for being the person saying, I denounce you and walking away, but then still following her heart, being true to herself and, you know, becoming what I believe is probably a truer Jedi than anything we saw from the council. Um, another thing, yeah. um, and this is, especially what we saw in the prequel and in the uh, Clone Wars is they're very oppressive and undermine democracy. Here we have a group of separatists, people that wanted to rule themselves free of the Republic. And what do the Jedi do? They amass it, you know, unknowingly, you know, they get this massive army and then start attacking them. You know, it's, it's crazy. Uh, so those are just a couple points. We can talk about more, but those are the, the big things. That uh, oh, and of course they think they're above the law. Obviously, mm -hmm. uh, you know, they are the law. To, to <laughs> I am the law. Um, to, to that point too, you you spark something in my mind that I, I don't think I've ever thought about before, which is the Jedi Council operates largely by fear, not just fear and intimidation yeah. of other people. I mean that that's they have their power because they're mystical and people don't understand and people are like awed by them, you know, but actually like when they find out that a kid is, is a force wielder or close to the force, they immediately snatch up the kid, take them out of their surroundings, put them into a controlled environment because the idea is if they don't, then the chance of that kid becoming a Sith Lord goes way up, even though two, there could only be two falling to the dark side or yeah, yeah. they're falling to the dark side in general and things like that. Right. So out of fear, they take these children and out of fear, they keep Jedi away from meaningful relationships and interpersonal connections. And out of yeah, fear, no. they, they don't promote Anakin, right? And then they have the audacity to tell Anakin that fear leads to the dark side. And they're not wrong about that, by the way. Um, but fear is not inevitably a path to the dark side. Fear is just experience. Fear is just life, right? Um, and to become courageous or to become brave is, is to conquer fear. So you have to. And then what does Yoda do with Luke? Yoda sends Luke into the dark side cave, that hollowed out stump on Dagobah where a Sith Lord was, was killed. And it's rich with the dark side. And Luke is like, well, what's in there? And Yoda is all, only what you take with you. And sends him in anyway. He knows it's going to be a terrifying experience for Luke. So like... I, I think maybe Yoda had grown since his days in the council, but the point is the Jedi council operates primarily through fear, their own fear and the fear that they evoke in others. Yeah. I mean, honestly, that's, that's one of the biggest things is of like how their perception of this Sith growing became clouded is, is precisely that um, it's poisoning by degrees, right? Yeah. Um, of understanding just this little tiny piece and oh man, I really don't want that to happen. So I'm just going to be a little bit afraid. Not a lot afraid, just a little bit afraid. I'm not force choking people. I'm just a little afraid. <laughs> right. But, uh, and then it just grows on itself because soon that fear becomes habit instead of a conscious choice. And, mm -hmm. and we see that in the real world too, right? I mean, that's one of the things that makes the analogy so beautiful of the, of the force and the light side and the dark side is that, the light side and the dark side of the force are, are all part of the force. Like they're all part of that experience yes. of connectivity and being part of everything else. But it's when we allow any one part of that to overtake us, that we shift away from a place of balance in nature. Yeah. And I, I've always found that gorgeous. Yes. One of the other things that you brought up specifically with, with Dagobah, right. That, that I really think kind of backs up that whole idea is that, 
there are these nexuses of light side and dark side energy that exist all over the galaxy, right? In fact, the and, Jedi Temple is sitting on one. Yeah. Exactly. And, and and so it's like, okay, if, if these nexuses exist naturally, we believe that the force is omnipotent or even if it's not always necessarily omniscient in that particular sense, but it is omnipowerful, right? Yes. And it is self-regulating and it wants to bring itself into balance. Why would these nexuses exist? Right. And while some of them, yes, are absolutely associated with former Sith Lords and people who were, you know, regress to the dark side, there's also just places of natural dark side energy. We see it on Korriban. We see it on uh, Mustafar. We see it on uh, Dathomir. Right. Mm -hmm. Like these are places that are, are natural wells of the dark side that are not associated with any specific thing. And even in the case of Dathomir, where you know, the force witches exist there. It's because they are so present next to that strong force energy that they, the likelihood that they are going to encounter it, create an aptitude for it and move into becoming force users goes up dramatically. Yes. It's just an interesting thing to contemplate. Well, I, the other thing is very interesting to me, and it's a point you hit on, uh, is the fact that, you know, they took away marriages and stuff like that in the old republic jedi got married jedi had kids at some point they took that away because fear again oh you know if they have kids or something like that they'll form attachments it'll be easier to follow the dark side i honestly think that is something that was a bad mistake yes that took away yeah. that connection connection is a positive thing um you know people that suffer from depression and stuff like that you know, the, the best solution for that, go connect with other people, be around other people. It, it's this weird dogma of you can't do that. It just seems so strange to me and foreign. Um, and, you know, and not only that, it's suppressing really healthy emotions when we can be excited for our children growing up or friends and family. So it would be this disconnection and uh, not attaching to you one self to another just seems so strange and weird that it's like why would you do that you know and i get they're kind of like monks and monks do that but that's seemed like ad place like the sith embrace that you know they embrace their passions and stuff like that um what would it be like if you had that passion and that connection with other people you know, how, how would that improve things, yeah. uh, which is very interesting. One of the, one of the things that I feel really is one of the defining factors, the difference between the light side and the dark side, right. Is a light side user trains themselves to abstain and a dark side user trains themselves to give in. Right. But really, neither of those is a fully adequate way to maintain mm -hmm. a moral goodness. Right. Right. Never exposing yourself to temptation does not make you stronger against temptation. Similarly, right. seeking out temptation so that you understand it also doesn't make you stronger to resist yeah. temptation. That's right. right. And we're not necessarily talking about the metaphysical religious high end temptation concept. No, we're talking but about it morality. Is the simple things. Yeah. yeah. If I never, you know, and, and it's, it's funny because we see this all the time with like kids who are raised vegetarian or vegan who try bacon for the first time. And then it's like their whole life just balloons out. And it's not every <laughs> case, right? Let's be very, very clear there. And that is also not necessarily a statement on vegetarian, veg vegetarianism, uh, vegetarianism or veganism, but it is to say more specifically in the way that that child is raised to understand why and what is and be allowed to make a choice and be allowed to experience something and, and figure out what makes sense because maybe if they got to try it once early on and they understood this is a thing and this is why we have made this choice maybe you'd have a kid who was more likely to do that thing right and yeah. and, and, and that and that's really a vital piece is that neither side is morally superior it's just one is in more control and there's yeah. a difference. Yeah. So, so, so let's sum this one up then. So the question is, would the universe have been a better place without the Jedi council? 
I say I think yes. We've got a unanimous yes here. Yeah. Yeah. I think well, you're right. I, yeah. I mean, I just one more thing to throw in. You know, uh, and, and I know this is a hard thing to do. Again, I love Star Wars. I love the Jedi. Oh yes, absolutely. But when I break this down, you know, they're a group of militants who train terrorists. Really, uh, <laughs> you know, there there's an episode. Uh, you know, at the end of episode two, Yoda shows up with a horde of you know, of lone troopers and just start attacking the Gen- Genosians. Excuse me, the yeah. Genosians. Yeah. Genosians, yeah. That. You know? And 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 the moral ground that they are taking in that moment is we're going to defend a Jedi and a senator who expressly disobeyed their orders and went out of the way to put themselves in danger. So now we're going to go massacre the people to which they have become yep. in danger. Yep. You know, uh, but, you know, even if you look at history, okay, a thousand years before when suddenly the Sith went out, you know, the Jedi were such battle-hardened military commanders that they actually had an army that they called the Army of Light. Um, and this is, a, this, this happened before, you know. Uh, it happened during the Mandalorian Wars where, a group of Jedi, you know, went after the Mandalorians, which, you know, we all know Darth Revan came from. So this is not out of the order. Another thing, you know, and I hate, you know, Jedi violate people, you know, violate people against their will. We've seen it countless times. These are not the droids you're looking for. Uh, you know, <laughs> that's, that's not yeah. cool. That's not cool. But um, yeah. mind yeah. influence and mind control being considered oh, yeah. light side power is really only more evidence to say that it's not necessarily moral superiority that determines a light side user from a dark side user it's truth what yeah. are you what are you trading yeah yeah, yeah so, I, yes. there, there's many other topics but i i do feel like when they originally were created they pro yes they were a place they were they were guardians of, they came with true intent to help people what we saw towards the end of episode three i definitely don't believe they were where they needed to be which then you know kind of makes begs the question is this truly the jedi council's fault or yoda's because he was in charge of the jedi council and trained over twenty thousand jedi which means more than likely he trained those other you know masters that sat in the circle with him well yeah. we don't know much about yoda's species yet or homeworld well, or anything else so you know maybe there's an overarching plot and the darth jar jar theory actually should have been darth Yoda all along <laughs> i think that's a topic for another episode i do actually think there's some meat on that bone but- no i think more of it is uh not really he's a he's a set but more no. of the fact that he definitely made mistakes and failed mm-hmm. um but instead of uh and, and this is where I, I really feel the jedi the council failed instead of admitting they made a mistake mm-hmm. and trying to correct that and rectify that they continued to make further and further mistakes to try to claim hey we didn't make a mistake I mean, out of fear, they didn't train Anakin. If they just would have trained Anakin from the start and said, yeah, you know, you're older than normal. We're going to do our best to help you. I think we would have gotten a much different Anakin. Yeah. And we wouldn't end up with Darth. Yeah. Um, so, so what's really the next the question then? Them. Yeah, so the larger question here is that does that hubris extend to all Force users regardless of the Jedi Council? And would the galaxy be better without Force users? I mean, it, that's a tough question. It really is. Because um, it really, it depends on where the start, the starting point. I mean, I, truth is, this is uh, I'm going to scan through my notes real quickly because I apparently did write some notes, which is awesome. Um, <laughs> so the Jedi are responsible for creating the Sith. Um so it's called, you know, the Sith Holocaust, a, you know, because there's a group of Jedi that just were done with the Jedi and the rules they were inflicting. And so had 
had been dabbling more in the dark side. Um, but was that really evil? You know, as we've said, you know, nature, which is the force, is this energy from both the destructive part of nature and the creative part of nature. Is that really a bad thing? You know, by them forbidding it instead of monitoring it, watching them and helping them, you know, by saying, nope, you can't do that. That forced them to, of course, dabble into it more. Because if you tell any kid, no, what are they going to do? They're probably going to do it. Hmm. Um, and when that's not checked and balanced and taught properly, then we, we end up with, the, you know, a group of people that are one, angry. They want to overthrow their teachers or their parents and show them up. Um, I really feel like because of that, that's why we have this weird dichotomy of light and dark. And then all these people get stuck in the middle when instead it could be, let's embrace both the light and the dark of us. You know, we can find some harmony here. I mean, that's a lot of the teachings of like Kung Fu and, uh, mysticism and stuff like that we Taoism. accept both sides yeah yeah um so how i mean that of course you know then we would have this this the conflict we have which we love um yeah. then it would be star peace dan and uh, clearly you're just trying to ruin star the fandom peace. <laughs> star star peace. That film. space calm <laughs> yes <laughs> um I, i'd like to hit on this question too and i'm trying to figure out how to word this exactly so please please take no offense at this one but um, I don't think it is a fair question. And the reason is something that I said earlier, which is that force wielders are agents of the force, that the force imbued them with this ability, that the force utilizes them as tools to correct itself, mm -hmm. to obtain homeostasis with uh, like you could you could see the universe as like a massive ecosphere trying to maintain balance of life and when you get down to the individual creatures that are in there yes there is life yes there is death yes there is a cycle and yes there is like uh energy flowing out of the force into life and then back into the force at the point of death etc cetera, etc cetera. in fact obi-wan kenobi sums it up best when he says it surrounds us it penetrates us it binds the universe together it is it is the energy of life and you're absolutely right that that nature that life comes with what we would consider good and evil or it comes with like uh with nurture and with hostility that we could talk about how how um courage is equal parts uh fear and choice right you have to face the fear and then make a choice and that's what makes courage and the same thing is true about passion passion is equal parts hate and love they both have to be there to make passion what it is uh, i yes. think that the question you know would it be better without um users of the force or or things like that i don't in that universe I don't think that's a fair question because I don't think that universe could exist without life forms that were closer to the force than others. I think it's just inherent in the system. So if you were to remove the designation of Jedi and the designation of Sith, I think you would still have mystical people who had the ability to manipulate the universe around them for good, for evil, for better, for worse. And you still have those people who are influenced by the universe, those people who are force sensitive, like even Han solo you know who who yeah. is basically guided in his destiny to get where he's going i think to to grab again to to reference a jurassic park quote and change it for this purpose i think the universe finds a way so i don't think the universe could survive without those creatures attuned to the force yeah i'm not i'm not saying that we get rid of those what i'm saying is the jedi because this is a, a dogma or set of rules that are applied to those individuals you know let we look at ahsoka you know she is removed from that set of rules and dogma she follows her heart she follows what her moral compass what is right and uses those abilities to defend others that are weaker than herself that can't do that i feel like that is a true jedi in my opinion you know using you know the light side I think the, the Jedi, because of their dogma and their strict rules that they put in place, actually do more damage. 
yeah to not only themselves as a body that govern themselves but also to the galaxy and those around them because of this strictness that they, they well, put over I, everything yeah. I, I agree with that statement i will say this if we were if we were to remove the concept of jedi and the concept and, and if you remove jedi you have to remove sith and vice versa like you said yeah. the jedi are responsible for the genesis of the sith and you were talking about like, well, you know, the Jedi are hunting down the Sith. And then what happens when the Sith get Anakin? They hunt down the Jedi. I mean, it's just, it's a reciprocal relationship, yeah, right? Yeah, they hunt down the Jedi, yeah. So, yeah. so what I will say is if you remove those designations, because of the way that life works, because of the way that uh, interpersonal relationships work and things like that, I think eventually, it, it, I think unavoidably, you will get factions of people those who will exert their power for gain and those who will exert their power for defense and i think no matter what you do you end up with jedi and sith if not in name in purpose so would the universe be better off maybe but i think it's inevitable i think that you always end up with factions so no i agree do you do you, do you want to hear my super metaphysical uh hyper theory take oh yes please do because i've been thinking about this ever since you brought this topic up um and i'm gonna it's gonna sound like i'm sidetracking for like 15 seconds and then i promise it's gonna come right back around seconds become minutes go what <laughs> you're right with me it's hours <laughs> but i'm gonna do my darndest krebs no no i got i, I have faith in you buddy <laughs> go for it so one of the things that we know about world building as authors, as game designers, right, um, is that the inherent relationship between technology and magic, right? Not, not only in terms of that any technology sufficiently advanced enough will appear as magic to somebody who doesn't understand it, but, th but within world building itself, the actual relationship that says, if you have a way to accomplish something, why would you do that thing if you can just do it right it's, it's a logical paradox that says if magic exists technology suffers star wars by aesthetic and by design is a low-tech recycled technology universe in which we also see all these ancient civilizations that seem to have these huge amazing uh, unbelievable pieces of technology and all of them destroyed themselves or each other, right? So if we assume that the force has some type of cognizance of, of being, of self, of recognition that's driving towards that homeostasis, and I recognized as that consciousness or collective consciousness or whatever that every time that one of these stinking civilizations gets technologically advanced enough they blow themselves and everyone else to smithereens. And all I want are life forms that can continue to feel and interact with me so that I can continue to be. Yeah, I'm going to invite force users to be a thing. And I'm going to do everything that I can to seed power so that we can just keep a lid on this thing before it gets out of hand again, <laughs> please and thank you. But then let's go even one step beyond that, right? Why are there people who are not as sensitive to the force or people who are intermittently sensitive to the force without being full on force users. What if at a higher level than even midichlorians or whatever else that the force is in fact the collective consciousness of all living beings and that therefore whenever people are being oppressed or are in danger of being destroyed that collective consciousness calls out and feels it and tries to correct that perceived wrong. And because of that, we see the pendulum of power swing. We see the way that dynamics shift between civilizations and people and who's in charge in the flavor of the day. Because those who are actively participating in that consciousness are not going to be the ones that are actively exercising that power unless it is the only option left. Um, and it may not even be something that they consciously choose. And so the force in a way does have that cognizance perhaps because it is in fact every consciousness that exists within that sea. It's just some are accessing it, uh, accessing that actual energy from others to try to right some of those wrongs. 
if we put everything into that context, then maybe in fact, the outcome of having a Jedi and a Sith faction is in fact the most preferable because it prevents that ultimate decay. Because anytime that one side starts to become too much, the other just rises up to meet it. Thoughts? Yeah. That, I mean, that makes a lot of sense. Um, I think uh, I think you and I are hitting on very similar points in that I think it's inevitable. I think it has to be. So it's not about a question of whether the universe would benefit or not. It's the universe has to have it. It's a necessity. Yeah. No, I mean, you guys, you, you guys are right. I mean, like you said, basic storytelling, you have to have conflict. Without conflict, it doesn't drive the story. Um, but inevitably, differences in opinion, ideology, thoughts, that creates conflict. Uh, we see it in our own world where, you know, as peaceful as we want it to be, there are factions out there that think one faction is wrong and they fight against that. Uh, so we definitely see that, you know, or, or one group is doing something they believe is helping their nation, their country, and they overdo it. We've seen that before, um, which I, I really feel like is kind of very similar to what the Jedi have done. They, they had good purpose. They had good ideas. They just overdid it. They, they, they went a little too far and didn't realize they stepped over that line, maybe. Um, or got too hubris or internally stuck that they couldn't see a way out of the line, you know, a way back past the line they crossed. I don't, I don't know. Uh, but no matter what, it still makes a great story. It still looks awesome every time you see a lightsaber flash ignite, whether it's green, blue, yellow, white, red, purple, whatever. It's still cool to see that. It's amazing to hear that. Um, and it will be interesting. I really would like to see um, some New Republic, or not New Republic, uh, Old Republic stuff, and maybe even some New Republic stuff. See, see, I think it was really fun and entertaining to see Solo. You know, I'm not a huge fan of it, but it was really nice to get a story without a Jedi in it, without a Sith in it. Um, but we still saw that conflict, that light and dark in there. Um, it would be interesting to see some other stories that have uh, no one uh, that we've seen in previous stories before. Let's see some other Jedis. Uh, if you haven't seen the Star Wars Vision, that's been kind of cool watching those, seeing these other interpretations of Jedi. Um, there's a really cool one that's kind of a, a samurai one. Oh, man, just amazing. So, uh, yeah. So how do we end this you know, yeah, in a place of hope and happiness and light, and not darkness? Well, I, I, I want to throw one more thought in there, and then we will hit on that message of hope. Because um, our our uh, new Grandmaster of Star Wars has taught us that that's always the message of Star Wars is hope, right? Uh, I, I want to kind of touch on something. You know, let, let's I, I want to look at a couple of different IPs. Let's look at Star Trek, which is, you know, a lot of people will consider Star Wars sort of at odds with Star Trek or, you know, you, you have a Trekkie versus a, a Star Wars fan or whatever. But... Um, but the truth is, like, look at Star Trek. The content, uh, the context of that is that there is no mystical force, right? Even if you have creatures who seemingly have, like, infinite power or whatever, we, we could talk about the Q continuum and blah, blah, blah. But, like, anything that looks particularly mystical is actually a highly evolved species from an alien planet, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. The idea is that there is no mysticism. Instead, what has Earth done? Earth has eliminated poverty. Earth has eliminated uh disparity of class they've eliminated bigotry they've eliminated uh disease they've eliminated all of these factors and then they go out into the universe to like spread to explore and hopefully improve the lives of other civilizations and almost immediately what happens highly evolved life forms capable of warped speed travel encounter them and almost immediately get into fights with them because there 
has to be opposition. I think the rule of opposition in all things is not is not special. It is actually, by definition, universal. There must be a counterweight to everything. So if you have a planet that is seemingly a utopia, there must be some place in the universe where there is suffering. And where you have a planet of peace, there must be a planet of war. And etc., etc., etc. Because that's what real balance is, Jedi Council. That's what real balance is. It's not the elimination of something. It is that you have counterforce. And similarly, if, if we look at Galaxy Quest, which I realize is a lampoon, uh, it is often regarded as like one of the best Star Trek movies ever made, right? Um, Galaxy mm -hmm. Quest, though, what do they have? They have a species of alien who have eliminated all deception. Have you ever asked yourself what their justice system looks like? You know, like, because it's not that people don't make mistakes, it's that they have no deception. They've eliminated it. For, they don't even understand the, they, they understand the, the basic definition of it, but they don't recognize it right? They just don't understand it um, or understand why it would be so natural to other species. And then immediately what happens? They get set upon by a warmongering, uh, power-hungry species, and then they have to go to their faux saviors for help. Uh, it's it, it, And bringing this all around for full circle, what does this mean for us? It means that it where where evil exists, there must also exist good. That you cannot have one without the other. That opposition is natural for the universe. And if one side becomes too powerful, and as we see, power on either side leads to a tipping of the scales in a non-beneficial direction. But whenever you fuel one side too much, it must be kept in check by empowering the other. And so... If you ever look around you and you see that there is disaster and tragedy and that there is evil and predation, I want you to know that even if it's not right there in front of you, I want you to know that somewhere, not far away, there is an opposing force of good, of people who sacrifice, of people who defend, forces who will push back on that which is evil and predatory and destructive and tragic. They will push back that tide. So that once again, we can find balance and goodness. I think that's where the hope comes from. There's always hope that a counter force will come back. Yeah. I wholeheartedly agree. Yeah, it kind of goes back to, I can't remember the exact saying, but whenever a hero is needed, a hero will rise to the challenge. I think mm -hmm. that's exactly it. Um, so... May, you know, yes. Yeah. I, I love how you brought Star Trek into that, even though I'm not a Star Trek fan, but you know, even you know, watching Picard, the this wonderful Starfleet is is crumbling. It's going it's become corrupt. It's not as wonderful as it once was. But I think inevitably we have kind of that attrition that, that happens. Something happens, there's an event, we learn something, and then we rebuild. Um, and I think that happens over and over. So, uh, again, that's just another moment of hope. Things will get better. And, you know, that's the one thing I like. Uh, that I, th Another point that I, I liked that came out of episode eight is, you know, when re referring to Ray, you know, Yoda says she has everything she needs. You know, and then we see the scene with the books. Mm -hmm. um, but really, that was just... That, that was very helpful. She doesn't need the dogma. Uh, and I think at that point, Yoda realizes a teacher, she can do this on her own. She can follow her heart and decide uh, what path to go. So, um, all right. Well, folks, um, I, I, I believe we're out of time. So, uh, we'd love to hear your opinions. We'd love to hear uh, what you think about the Jedi, what you think about what we've said. Do you agree or disagree? If you disagree, that's okay. If you agree, okay. But we want to hear your opinion. So jump on Discord uh, or even shoot us an email at info at dungeoncrawlersradio.com. We'd love to hear your opinion. And we, if we get your messages, we're going to read them. We're going to give a shout out to you guys. 
um, on the next episode, real, you know, we'll just take a few minutes to let uh, to read out your comments and give a shout out to you. So uh, with that said, we'll catch you next Dungeon time. Dungeon crawlers, regardless of whether you are in balance or only seeking it, tell your story, whatever may come. And as you push back against the tide, always remember to be epic and don't suck. Remember, the force will be with you. Always.